What is the number one employee complaint? Anyone want to guess? Someone guess. Boss. You're, you're, you're not a legitimate contributor. <laughs> you said bosses. <laughs> Uh, so you're going to win a prize, and the prize is you're going to get a second book that you can give to a spouse, boss, whoever, and I'll autograph it for you later. First. Round of applause. I love it. Okay, so there's an important bit of learning there. You speak up, you get rewarded. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. So bosses, Jason, you said bosses. Bosses. What else? What are employee complaints? No recognition. No recognition. Very good. Coworkers. Coworkers. Salary. But can I have a round of applause? All of those are just great. <laughs> and of course, all of them were wrong. Uh, the number one employee complaint, it's too cold. This is the international facility manager. Uh, <laughs> Anyone want to guess the number two employee complaint? It's too hot. Too hot. You told me this was a sharp crowd. <laughs> I tell you. So the question is, your managers, the people who are trying to keep your company going, have to work in a work environment where half of them are too hot and half of them are too cold. Do you see the challenge here? Now, is it any wonder? Does anybody know what that is? That's the Commodore Hotel in Beirut, Lebanon. And during the Lebanese Civil War, if you checked in to the Beirut Commodore Hotel, well, it was a very popular hotel for journalists during the war. So it wasn't like, you know, you check into the Sheridan smoking room, not smoking room. They would ask a very simple question in the middle of the Civil War. Sniper side or shelling side? <laughs> Sound like your job in HR? Sound like being the boss? You get sniped from below, you get shelled from above. It's very, very difficult to be a boss today. And what I want to do is I want to speak to all of you because you have an amazing opportunity to change the dynamic of boss. I understand HR has a natural tendency toward compliance issues. I get it. You are the buffer between going to jail and your company, and you have to pay attention to all that stuff. But I do think, and this is a phrase that I'm going to use uh, with some trepidation, you do have a higher calling, and that is the workforce management side, to ensure that your company is firing on all sectors. So my focus today is simply to try to give you some tools a different way of looking at what you can do to get your employees and your bosses firing on all cylinders. Does that make sense as an agenda? You with me? Okay. Um, in, in my own quirky style. So if there was a simple goal for today, the goal would be best represented by this picture. Everybody, anybody like Inspector Clouseau and Pink Panther movies here? I'm a, that, Glad to see that back row really excited about that. <laughs> it wasn't that they raised their hands, it was the way they raised their hands, and I appreciate that so much. So uh, my favorite scene in Pink Panther movie was the scene when Clouseau walks into the lobby of the hotel, and there's a dog on the floor, and there's a guy behind the counter, and he says, uh, does your dog bite? And the guy says, no. And the guy, so Clouseau walks over to pet the dog. Of course, the dog takes a chomp out of his arm. And he turns to the guy and he says, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. And the guy said, it's not my dog. <laughs> to me, that's the key question of trying to manage in this recession, not a recession. We could do a little vote later about where exactly are we. It's a real challenge to try to manage today because you've got to ask the right questions. We could get by in business for a long time half asleep. But in this economy, with these challenges, these competitors, technology, the whole mix, you got to be asking the right questions. And in my experience, we're often asking the wrong questions. You know the old phrase about generals? The generals always fight the last war? I, I don't know that CEOs and executives of top companies are necessarily any different. So what can we do, dare I say, to fight this war? to deal with these issues today. So to me, the real key challenge in my 16 years of writing and speaking and observing about the workplace is the bosses struggle to listen, employees struggle to speak up, and there's hardly any empathy between the two. Does anyone want to disagree with me on that front? We are broken at the most basic level of organization. It's, it's amazing to me. So what I did for a really long time was I used to hold worst boss contests. And I would give a prize to whoever had the worst boss story. 
Uh, normally, I only tell one of these, but I'll, I'll tell a couple just because of uh, the fear factor. Um, my, my favorite all-time worst boss story, and again, I have kind of a macabre sense of humor about this. This is my profession. My favorite worst boss story was the boss, a man stood up at one of my speeches and said, my worst boss asked his assistant to type her own termination letter. But there's, but there's a better one that I think in terms of really capturing the, the sickness that really happens in a lot of workplaces. Again, I'm an equal opportunity basher. I'll bash employees, I'll bash bosses. Because I think that that's, we got to work on this from both angles. But there was uh, an employee who stood up in his worst boss contest and he said, this really happened to me when I was first starting out. I was an enthusiastic young buck. I, I just wanted to change the world. So I went up to my boss and I said, uh, I, got, I got so many ideas. I've been working here a week and I got like six ideas of what we can do better. And the boss said, great, what I want you to do is write down every one of those aisle ideas and get a file, new idea file, and put it in the new idea file. So a month goes by and the employee goes up to the boss. He said, oh man, I'm so excited. You know, I've got my, my new idea files like that thick. And the boss said, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. Every two months, just throw the file into the garbage. This, this is, you know, 50,000 emails. This is the kind of stuff that really happens in the workplace. And so, what you are, you're that crux point that can really focus your efforts on better relationships between bosses and employees. So I come here with a great deal of passion to try to inspire and challenge you to own that workforce issue, to really try to make that interaction between bosses and employees much smoother, much more higher function. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you some studies, I'm going to give you some frameworks, I'm going to give you possibly the quirkiest way, hopefully most memorable way, to look at some of these workplace issues. Now what I want to ask you to do is not take any notes during the speech. What I'd like to you to do is write down my email address and email me and I'll send you all the notes to the speech. But you know how when you go on vacation and you're so into taking pictures that you actually don't experience much of the vacation? Has anyone ever had that experience? So what I want to ask you to do is not experience that. I just want you to sit back, relax, take a deep breath and listen. And the notes that I send you will have all of the key points from the presentation. So my email address, I will give it to you now. Bob at workplace911.org. Bob at workplace911.org. So, It'll also be on the slides a couple of times. Uh, I do also want to just take a moment and, and thank Knowledge Infusion. Um, these are really, really interesting people doing really interesting work. Um, I, I do have to only challenge one thing that was said in the introduction. I, I believe that Americans are expanding. I, I've not seen many ex Americans contracting. So I had a slight intellectual <laughs> argument with that issue. But no, I think these people are just great people doing great work. Um, you all, I'm not telling you any news because you're here. Um, I do want to thank them for making it possible for all of you to have a copy of the book. Um, that was very sweet of them. Blake has been wonderful to work with. So um, could, and, and this isn't one of those polite corporate things, you know. C could I have a slightly raucous amount of applause for Knowledge Infusion here, please? Thank you. Yeah. Come on, the Bears won last night. I want to hear some enthusiasm out of the crowd. So uh, now, I've been just blathering on for about 10 minutes. What I would really like to do is have this be much more of a conversation. Now again, you've seen me bribe people in this room to speak. So I really want to encourage you, if you have an example, an idea, if you want to challenge me, I would really like to hear many of your voices um, in my re remaining time here. So I, I've not been one of those speakers who filled every minute full of speech. Uh, I've left lots of gaps in terms of a conversation. I'd love to hear examples, whatever. So uh, will you all raise your right hand and be deputized uh, to be contributors to this conversation? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Usually when I ask people to raise their hand, they get a little nervous, but that's a whole other story. Um, OK, so where are we pointed? This, this is probably my favorite example of the, the shining city on the hill of what's possible in organizations. <laughs> when you're firing on all cylinders. Uh, this is a tackle box made by a company called Plano Molding Company. 
and they made fish in tackle boxes. And they started getting calls in the shipping department from women in New York City with one name ordering their fishing tackle boxes. Does anybody see where this is going? Fashion models started to realize that these fishing tackle boxes made great makeup cases. Well, lo and behold, Caboodles is born. Caboodles, and women here aware of Caboodles? Caboodles makes these fancy high-end makeup cases. Now, you almost, this story is almost too good to be true. They are making insanely large profits, much, much bigger selling makeup cases to women than they ever made selling fishing tackle boxes to fishermen. Now, what's the point here? The point here is some guy in shipping picked up on this opportunity. And he created a much bigger business than the business they were in. Pardon me, I'm going to do my little Sarah Palin impersonation. <laughs> it's fascinating. Opportunities present themselves very seldom at the CEO level. They often present themselves at the guy in the shipping department who's saying, this is the third model this week. I got to talk to somebody about this. What can we all do to create an environment where the people who stumble across the ideas don't have their boss say, oh yeah, and every month throw out all those ideas in your folder? We have to create more dynamic, more engaged, more involved workplaces. You know it in terms of the economy. You know it in terms of the employees you have who are now doing the jobs of multiple people. But what we have is we have a lot of bosses running on fumes. We have a lot of employees kind of going through the motions. How can we really engage people to create these kind of opportunities? With me? OK, I want to do an HR blatant thing right now. Um, I, done, I did an HR conference in, in uh, Sacramento. And it was all the top 20 companies in Sacramento, a lot of government agencies, but all the top employers in Sacramento. And I, I, I began the presentation, it was like four days before um, Thanksgiving. So I began the presentation by saying, I don't know about all of you, but I was born and raised in New Jersey. And at Thanksgiving, we had the adults table and the children's table. Does everybody relate to this? So question I want to ask you is, where are you at? Are you at the children's table or are you at the adults table? And it was one of the greatest things that I've ever said in a speech, because from then on, every time someone spoke, they would say, well, I'm at the adults table because. And they were all having to prove that they were at the adults table. And finally, at the very end of the day, one woman said, I'm at the children's table. It's great, because you can, you, don't have, you know, the adults aren't watching, you can have fun. <laughs> it's kind of a great way to kind of have the conversation. But, but to me, I think ultimately the question of HR and why your job is so hard is because to be effective, you have to be able to mix at both the adult table and the children table. And, and that, no one else in the corporation is asked to do that. But when you can really do that, when you can slide into the adult's table, slide into the children's table, broker between the two, you can be insanely effective. Now, I've, I've pumped you up, correct? If you feel good about yourself, now I'm going to like just throw a little dart at you. Here's the question. If you go back 15 years, at the children's table was HR and the IT people, right? Remember, they had bad personal hygiene, kind of greasy, stringy hair. Do you remember, remember those days? <laughs> and so um, one of the things that's really interesting is recently, the IT people have managed to jump to the adult table. But by and large, as a function, and some of you may be able to challenge me on this and say, no, it's not the case. But I think if you look at SHRM, if you look at the HR landscape, a whole lot of HR is still at the children's table. Now, the irony here is the IT people or anyone else can't do their jobs without you functioning highly. So my thing is, it's not just as individuals. As a function, we have to get HR to be smoothly at the adult table, to really be effective. You all are the key player in your organization, but you're not necessarily viewed that way. 